On February the 23rd, in the 2002 Winter Olympics at Salt Lake City, Alan Baxter was on the verge of sporting history. Alan begins his second run in the Olympic slalom, and he's going for a medal. Absolutely no reason to hang back here. He's answered his critics with a first run performance. Britain had never been this close to winning an Olympic medal in downhill skiing, and Baxter, nicknamed the Highlander, was on blistering form. He's come through the danger section safely. The man from Abbey Moor negotiates the undergate without apparently losing too much speed. A little skid sideways. Alan stays on course. Now's the time to risk and let the skis run. And what happened next became a cause for national celebration. 141.82 for Abbey Eight. Can Vidal beat that and take gold? Yes, he can. Jean-Pierre Vidal skis tactically well to take the gold for France. The silver goes to Amiens, but most importantly, Alan Baxter from Great Britain wins the Olympic slalom bronze medal and makes history in Deer Valley. Within weeks, Baxter made the headlines again, this time for all the wrong reasons. He'd failed a routine drugs test for the IOC, the International Olympic Committee. Just a couple of days after Baxter arrived home as a national hero, the IOC told him he'd tested positive for the banned substance methamphetamine. And if a second test on his sample corroborates the first, he'll then be stripped of his medal and possibly banned from the sport. Before the game started in the United States, Alan Baxter bought a Vicks nasal spray. Athletes are under strict controls about what they can and can't put in their body, but Baxter wasn't worried. This product was on the list of allowed medications in the UK, so he assumed that the American version had the same ingredients and would be exactly the same. Unfortunately for Baxter, the same brand nasal spray in the US also contained methamphetamine as a decongestant. And methamphetamine is a molecule whose components can be rearranged to form an isomer. The same atoms, but shuffled about in such a way that the molecule's chemistry is different. The chemical limonene, for instance, has one isomer that smells of lemon, the other orange. But in Baxter's case, an isomer was the difference between an Olympic medal and public disgrace, followed by years trying to clear his name. So if you thought isomers were only useful for school chemistry exams, we'll show how these unusual molecules can affect all of our lives. But to fully understand Baxter's situation and other more controversial incidents, we need a better understanding of isomers themselves. Professor Jonathan Claydon from the University of Manchester. OK, well, let's start with a molecule. A molecule is an assemblage of atoms which are bonded together. And an isomer is really molecules where the atoms are bonded together in different ways. So it's got exactly the same atoms or number of atoms. So if it was water, I know water doesn't have an isomer, H2O, but most people know H, two atoms of hydrogen, O, one atom of, of oxygen. If you just rearrange them a bit, that would be an isomer. That's right, yes. As you say, water doesn't, doesn't have other isomers, but there are molecules which are relatively simple, where there are several isomers. If the atoms are joined together to the same atoms, but in different directions, the bonds are orientated in different ways, we call these stereoisomers. And are they of any importance? I mean, obviously, when chemists discovered this, they must have been like, oh, wow, what, you know, what's this all about then? Yes, I mean, stereoisomers are, are very important. One of the interesting features they have is that two stereoisomers often have similar but not identical properties. Now, it's important here perhaps to, to mention there are two types of stereoisomers. One very important type are when two molecules are simply mirror images of one another, and these stereoisomers are known as optical isomers or enantiomers. And in this case, the two molecules have identical physical and chemical properties, but in certain situations, for example, if they're used uh, in conjunction with a biological system, say as a drug, they will have different activities or, or different modes of action. Alan Baxter did his best to convince the Olympic drug testing team that this different mode of action was to blame for his positive drug test. 
Methamphetamine has two isomers that are mirror images of each other, an L for levo or left form and a D for dextro or right-handed version. One of these versions is a decongestant, the other a stimulant, which acts directly on the nervous system to speed up reaction times and slow down fatigue. This is how Baxter put it in an interview at the time on Five Live. Well, basically, methamphetamine is in the IOC rules as a, a banned substance, but that is broken up into two parts. There's, there's the L side, which is basically the nasal decongestant, which is what you use, which is what I used, and the D side is uh, basically yeah, street drugs, sort of speed. Right. Okay. And and your argument was that you were using the one, the L one, which again is not performance enhancing in any way. How can it be? Exactly, and there's a test that can prove which side you were using, and, and they wouldn't give me the chance to take that test. So even though they may have accepted that you were using the L version of this, they still said, look, it's a banned substance, that's it. Exactly. How do you feel about their reaction to it, and, and how intransigent they were? Well, I think they should split the test up. I mean, give me a fair chance. These drugs, L and D methamphetamine, work differently in the body, even though they're made up of the same components. Jonathan Claydon maintains a sporting theme to explain why this happens. Let's take you're playing the game of tennis with someone. So you hit the ball to each other. It doesn't matter actually if you use your left or your right hand. And there were many left handed tennis players, that works quite well. Now imagine if you were a hockey player and you were joining in a hockey match. There's no way that you can play hockey left-handed. It just doesn't work. In fact, left-handed hockey sticks don't exist. You have to play right-handed because you're joining a situation where all of the other people involved, all of the rest of that system, is just using one hand. And when we put a drug into a biological system, it's very much like that drug joining the molecular hockey match that's going on within the body. It has to take part in that system, and therefore it must exist only as the correct hand to do what it's going to do. So if they're so different, why didn't the Olympics Committee recognise this and test for the right version of methamphetamine? Professor Robert Forrest from the Royal Hallamshire Hospital in Sheffield is a forensic toxicologist who supported Baxter's claims. Well, UK VIX doesn't contain any amphetamine-like drug at all. The American version contains L-methamphetamine as the active ingredient but not in the UK version. but not in the UK the UK version contains menthol and one or two other things and having tried both I can tell you that the American version works an awful lot better but the International Olympics Committee regulations don't differentiate or didn't differentiate at that time between L and D methamphetamine just as the English law doesn't differentiate between L and D methamphetamine if you're in possession of L methamphetamine in the country if you go to the United States on holiday and you come back with an inhaler of VIX brought in the United States you could be liable for possession of a class B drug in the United Kingdom and that can attract quite significant penalties clearly nobody is going to prosecute you for that the Crown Prosecution Service would exert prosecutorial discretion unless there was some grossly aggravating factor like you were trying to extract it and use it to do something else with Baxter's reason for the positive drug test the unintentional use of an isomer was eventually accepted by the Court of Arbitration for Sport his name was cleared a three-month ban was overturned but unfortunately he still had to give up his bronze medal. I was dead chuffed mm. when I heard the news that he had got it and I was so black disappointed when he lost it. But leaving emotion apart, there was science behind there and science to sort out. He was, in my view, foolish about the penalty that that foolishness attracted was above and beyond that which should reasonably have been applied and was out of proportion to the offence. Shortly after Baxter was cleared, the IOC listed both isomers of methamphetamine as banned in their revised regulations. And athletes are now aware, as should we be, that any drugs bought abroad are not necessarily the same as the ones we use at home. Baxter continues to ski and was 16th in the recent Winter Olympics in Turin. 
And while there's no doubt that Baxter had a tough time, there have been other, far more serious, physical repercussions through failing to fully understand the possible effects of isomers. About four o'clock in the morning, just as dawn was breaking, the baby was born. And the midwives said the usual things. Oh, you've got a little girl. Oh, what a squashed up nose she's got now. Who's got a squashed up nose in your family? And they were talking very brightly to me in what I presumed was the usual way of talking to a, a new mother. We could see at once that something was wrong. I wrapped her in a nice warm wrapper and put her in her cradle. And as I came back to the bed, my pupil midwife and I looked at each other over our masks and there was a great deal of expression in her eyes. Well, we tidied up and we went into the bathroom to get some more water and my pupil said to me, did you see, did you see what's happened? And I said, yes, I have. Um, she said, well, what are you going to do about it? You're behaving as though nothing had happened. And I said, well, we must get the mother just quietly over this. We must give her an hour or so of peace and happiness because this is going to be a terrific shock to her and we dressed the baby and gave her to the mother to hold and as you know most mothers say is my baby all right but this mother said isn't it wonderful when you have a perfect baby and then i went down into the kitchen i said to the father i think you'd better sit down because i've got some rather bad news for you i said what is wrong is the child blind or what is it she said no i don't quite know what is the cause of it, but she's born without her hands and only has one leg. Dr. Klaus Newman. My first contact was when I was a medical registrar at the Whittington Hospital, London. That must have been about 57 or 58. And uh, this was a baby that was born with very rudimentary upper and lower limbs. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before, and it died shortly afterwards. Although no one realised at the time, that baby's condition was a result of the drug thalidomide. Dr Newman is now medical advisor to the Thalidomide Trust, but back then it took a while for the medical profession to realise that these birth defects, including shortened or loss of limbs, damaged hearing, eyesight and in some cases brain damage, were all part of a much larger problem. The first thing that happened was that a number of physicians in Germany came across children with severe limb deficiency. Also, other physicians came across with children with absence of the external ears. And these things are extraordinarily rare at all other times. And they then began to realize that they were seeing three or four of these within a few months, whereas previously maybe they'd seen one in 20, 30 years. So it took at least a year before these different groups of physicians realize that other physicians like themselves were having a similar experience. I mean, if an epidemic is a sudden occurrence of previously extremely rare conditions throughout a very large geographical area, then this is an epidemic. And it was only later that people realized that the geographical area corresponded exactly to where thalidomide was being produced under license or directed by Grunenthal. The German drugs company Grunenthal was set up after the Second World War and made antibiotics under license to an American drug company. The trouble began when the company decided to experiment making their own products. They were on the lookout for some new drug, some new substance. Then they invented thalidomide and tested it for antibiotic action. It didn't have any. But they then found, through an absolutely grisly experiment which was done later in which they suspended eight rats above sulfuric acid so can you imagine the the fumes of this and they then subjected these rats they they hung they were suspended by wires and platinum electrodes were suspended from the rat every time the rat moved the platinum electrode would touch the acid and some hydrogen would thereby be released and they measured the hydrogen they call this the wiggle test. I would call it something else. And they found that thalidomide had good sedative action. Oh, wow, they said. This is wonderful because we need sedatives. People are taking their lives with barbiturates. And so suddenly thalidomide, from having been a failed antibiotic, became a sedative. 
and you gave it to children when the adults wanted to watch television. You gave it widely, and the, it was a very peculiar drug. It is a very peculiar drug because you could not kill rats with it. The drug had other uses than as a sedative, and in the late 1950s and early 60s, women in the UK, my own mother included, were being offered the lidamide for severe nausea during pregnancy. She decided against taking the drug, but the inadequate testing and lack of awareness of isomers by drug companies led to a generation of children affected by thalidomide. At that stage, we're talking about 40 or more years ago, the importance of left and right-handed forms in drug molecules hadn't fully been realised. Chemists knew about this, this property, but hadn't really uh, perhaps applied the knowledge. And what happened with thalidomide was it was administered as a, as a mixture of the left and right-handed forms. And almost certainly the harmful side effects of thalidomide were due to one of the two forms, but not the other. Now, subsequently, it's been thought perhaps that those side effects could be avoided if just one of the forms was administered. But we now know that thalidomide actually interconverts in the body between the two forms so it's not safe at all to give to women who are pregnant. So you think there's, there's a perhaps misapplication of a drug there without fully understanding these forms at, at the time because this was in the, the early the early 60s and that doesn't necessarily mean that a drug which has an isomeric form is going to cause problems. Exactly, yes. I think as it happens, thalidomide exists as these two isomers, but I think these, these problems may well have occurred even if it hadn't done. I think it's more a problem with thalidomide itself rather than simply the fact it can exist as, as two stereoisomers. And there are many, many other examples where there is a left and a right-handed form and uh, one of the two forms is harmful, but nonetheless it's a good drug, is L-DOPA, which is used to treat Parkinson's disease. Um, L-DOPA is made just as the left-handed form because the right-handed form does cause side effects. I think it causes some vision problems and it's quite toxic. And in fact, L-DOPA is another nice example because it was the first drug to be made industrially just in a single stereoisomeric form. The process was designed just to give that one stereoisomeric form and the inventor of that process won the Nobel Prize in 2001, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, uh, essentially for that discovery. Thalidomide isn't the only drug with different isomeric properties. Dr Martin Leonard is a reader in clinical pharmacology at the University of Sheffield. There's a drug called ketamine which is used as an anaesthetic which is given as a 50-50 mixture. Some people who are put to sleep with ketamine wake up with hallucinations and nightmares. There's quite good evidence that it's one of the isomers of the 50-50 mixture is causing this. And there's a reasonably good case that this drug should be given as a single isomer to cause the anesthesia, but not these unpleasant effects. Does this mean then that any drugs that are being manufactured, they must have to be very carefully tested to see not only if there are isomers that will be converted into the body from one form or the other, but also the effect of, of them as well on, on the body? Yes, exactly. I think that what the drug companies will do now, if they have a drug, a compound that they want to develop and it has a chiral centre, and it will exist as these two forms. The company will probably test the two forms for their activity and if one is more active than the other they will take that into further development and discard the less active compound. Separating the two forms of a compound would seem to be the answer in cases like this but according to Professor Jonathan Claydon it's not always easy. That is a real challenge because, as I've said, the, the left and the right-handed forms of a molecule have very similar, well in fact identical, chemical and physical properties, all but one or two little features that can't be used for separation. And in order to, to actually get to the point where these molecules can be separated, we have to somehow interact them with another type of molecule that also has a left and a right-handed form. Perhaps one way to explain this might be to say, let's, let's say you were trying to separate left and right-handed shoes with a light out. <laughs> How would you do that? You'd pick them all up. It'd be very difficult to tell which is which. But one good way would be to use your left foot and try them on your left foot and see if they fitted. And so that's how effectively, chemically, what we have to do to get left and right-handed molecules separated. 
And one of the sort of upshots of that, the fact that that is difficult, means that chemists have spent a lot of time and effort in designing ways not just of separating molecules, but actually of making molecules as just one form right from the word go, so they don't have to waste the 50% that you lose if, you, if you're actually trying to separate the two molecules. But if a molecule does have an isomer, and some can have thousands, it's not an automatic cause for concern. Ibuprofen, for instance, which is commonly taken for headaches, is a mixture of left and right-handed versions. With ibuprofen, in the test tube, only one form is active as an anti-inflammatory. The other one's inactive. You give it in the body as a mixture, the inactive form is converted slowly to the active form. And that's not how it works, it just complicates how it works. So people say, why give a drug this 50-50 mixture of active and rubbish? Why not separate it, get rid of the rubbish, and just keep to the active? But there are quite a lot of drugs, which it doesn't matter. Something like, you heard of a drug called propranolol, a beta blocker. No. Take it for angina and high blood pressure. Well, that's a 50-50 mixture of active and non-active, and it doesn't really matter that you've got the, the, the non-active. Dr. Martin Leonard. It may come as a surprise to find that thalidomide is once again in use in Britain. It's being used. Thalidomide, on one of the world's most notorious drugs, is being given to patients as part of a revolutionary new treatment for cancer. The study of isomers is an active area of research for chemists. Even thalidomide has possible benefits, since it's currently used in some countries to treat a complication of leprosy as well as being investigated for the treatment of cancers and HIV. Not everyone is happy about the drug's reintroduction, but scientists need to find out how these and other isomers work for possible drug treatments. Professor Clayden again. Isomers in many cases are separable, they don't interconvert, we've talked about one example where they do, but in many cases they don't. But there are certain forms of isomers which, by simple rotations within a molecule, can convert from one form to another. So the shape of the molecule switches just by rotating from one isomeric form to another. And what we're trying to do is develop ways of controlling that rotation, both the rate at which it happens and whether one form is preferred over the other. There are now certain drug candidates, for example, where this is known to be a feature, this slow rotation within the molecule. And we'd like very much to be able to control whether you have one or the other rotational form. And that's really where our main research work lies. One of the things we've discovered that's very interesting is that if you have a much more complex molecule with several of these rotational features within it, what you do at one end of the molecule can sometimes affect the rest of the molecule. So you can have a sort of a, a domino effect running through the molecule, which is not possible in the types of isomers where interconversion it doesn't take place, but is certainly possible in these rotational forms. And these sorts of sort of flexible molecules with more fragile stereoisomerism could be very useful in a number of ways. You could imagine a situation where that change in conformation is like a switch and can lead to transmission of information, for example, on a molecular level. It's funny you should say switch because that was what was going through my mind then when you made that description because it sounded like the sort of digital switching by rotating the molecule from a sort of one to a zero, one to a zero, which immediately then makes me think of, ah, computers, mm. zero, one, zero, one, which is the basis of, of, of what we use <laughs> every day. Would that be the same sort of way in which a molecular computer could possibly work then using these isomers that could rotate effectively in the same way as a yes, non-zero? Uh, we're, we're probably talking about some years in the future, but in principle, yes, we could move right down to the molecular scale and use a rotational process to switch between one form and another. And we can take our lead really here from biology, because in many cases there are biological systems, for example proteins and receptors, which do just this switch. Haemoglobin is a good example actually. When haemoglobin binds oxygen to carry oxygen around in the blood, after the first molecule of oxygen has bonded to haemoglobin, it becomes much more easy for other molecules to bond as well. And that's because haemoglobin undergoes a switch in conformation, and it, that changes its function. So we're sort of learning from biology and applying biological ideas in, in chemistry. It sounds like this is a, a really promising field. Are there any disadvantages? Are there, are there any areas where y y you would think, well, yes, it could do this, but there's also the possibility of it perhaps doing that, which is not necessarily what you want? The disadvantage, I think, probably with, with these sort of rotational processes is that 
for example, if you're designing a drug, you want to make sure that when that drug's taken and when it's in the body, it behaves as you expect it to. Controlling it. it. You, yes, that, you, want, right. you need to you, control it. You need it. to be able to control it. And so if you have a drug which, which changes to another form over, let's say, a period of hours, well, that could be very difficult because then the function of the drug while it's in the bloodstream could change with time. So you really want a drug that interconverts very rapidly so it's always the same, or very slowly, so it never changes. And you have a real disadvantage if your, your sort of interconversion takes place over, over a period of hours. Carefully controlled, synthetically produced isomers are a potential boon to human health and a possible means of molecular computing. But in nature, scientists have discovered that isomers are also produced for good reason. <coughs> Oh, another very interesting example is male elephants, and this is quite a recent discovery, that male elephants produce um, pheromones, that's uh, to attract a, a mate, um, and actually they produce a mixture of left and right-handed forms of the pheromone molecule. But when they enter a state which is known as musk, it's a sort of a heightened sexual state that, that elephants go into periodically, the ratio of the left and right-handed forms of the molecule they produce changes, and this controls how long they remain in this state, and also controls which female elephants are attracted to them. Them. And the ratio can depend on the age of the ele elephant and a number of other things, such as the male elephant's social status. And uh, different uh, females of different ages and different social statuses will be attracted according to the ratio of left and right-handed uh, molecules the elephant produces. So if a male elephant produces more right-handed versions of the molecule, will the female elephant with more right-handed types of uh, her own particular pheromone then be attracted towards that one? Well, presumably the female has receptors for the, for the male pheromones, which I don't think we really know the fine details about, and in some way the, those receptors must be able to distinguish the left and the right-handed forms of the, the male elephant's pheromones, yes. So it could be opposites attract then, or yes, it could be the same? Yes, it could be, it could be opposites. Just like life. <laughs> 180 years after they were first recognised, scientists continue to unravel the expanding world and enormous potential of isomers. But, like most chemicals, they must be handled with care.